All right, organic chemistry too. Let's talk about some ways to make amino acids. How do we make our own amino acids? Because organic chemists are oftentimes interested in building their own amino acids that are not naturally occurring amino acids that they might want to incorporate into a potential drug. So we're going to take a look at some ways to make amino acids. And one of them involves the hell volhard zelinsky reaction, which I call the HVZ reaction. We looked at that way back in chapter 21. So the hell volhard zelinsky reaction is where we take a carboxylic acid and we stall a bromine at the alpha position. How do we do that? We take our carboxylic acid, we treat it with bromine and phosphorus tribromide, followed by water, and we end up with a bromine at the alpha position. Well, the bromine can react with excess ammonia in just a plain old SN2 reaction. And when we do that SN2 reaction, we get the nucleophilic attack, we get the loss of our leaving group, and then we incorporate that primary amine to generate an alpha amino acid. Now, you might be thinking, well, if I have excess ammonia, isn't this just going to keep alkylating and alkylating? And it's usually prevented from doing that because this group is so bulky that it prevents another SN2 reaction from occurring on the amine. So we use the hell volhard zelinsky reaction followed by an SN2 with ammonia to make an alpha amino acid. The next one is a really ingenious synthesis. It's called the amidomalonate synthesis. It's where we use diethyl acetamidomalonate, which is an analog of um, uh, diethylmalonate that we saw earlier on in the malonic ester synthesis, which is where we made carboxylic acids. But now with this acetamido group attached here, we have one acidic proton on this compound, diethyl acetamidomalonate, and we can treat that with sodium methoxide. We do the deprotonation to make the doubly stabilized enolate, and then we treat that with an alkyl halide where we can then do an SN2 reaction. So we install a new R group, and we looked at the mechanism earlier on in the class for how when we hydrolyze this to a dicarboxyl, we lose CO2, and in the process, we produce a carboxylic acid. So it's a pretty ingenious synthesis of an alpha amino acid. Now keep in mind, since the last step is treating the intermediate, or the, this molecule here, with acid and heat, you end up with the protonated form of the amine. So the amidomalonate synthesis, or the amidomalonate synthesis, and the starting material for the amidomalonate synthesis is diethyl acetamidomalonate. Okay, so kind of a mouthful there, but it's a very, very useful synthesis. So what part was incorporated into our amino acid? Well, you can see that the R group was incorporated. So whatever comes past the alpha carbon, okay, anything beyond the alpha carbon, that would have to be part of our alkyl halide. Let me show you what I mean. If you wanted to make this compound here, so this is phenylalanine, and it's racemic, of course. Well, the way that you would do that is this part here would have to come from your alkyl halide, from your electrophile. So you see that they're starting with diethyl acetamidomalonate and treating it with sodium methoxide and then benzyl bromide as the electrophile, right? Because when you make the doubly stabilized enolate, that's going to do your SN2 reaction and you're going to end up installing all of this piece here. And that's what's going to end up in the blue box shown at the end. So if you want to synthesize an amino acid, just like phenylalanine or depending on whatever it is, Whatever comes beyond the alpha carbon, that has to be part of your electrophile in the amidomalonate synthesis. Another option is what's called the Strecker synthesis. Strecker is obviously named after a scientist named Strecker. And it's a two-step synthesis from an aldehyde. So we start with an aldehyde. We treat it with ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide. And we end up with this interesting compound here called an alpha amino nitrile. Here's our nitrile group. That would make this the alpha carbon, and it has an amine attached directly to it, so we get an alpha amino nitrile. And we saw earlier on in the course that we can hydrolyze a nitrile to a carboxyl, to an amino acid, by using acid. So here it doesn't mention heat, but you could put heat in if you wanted, 
it doesn't really make a big difference. So we just simply hydrolyze that nitrile to the carboxylic acid. So there's the Strecker synthesis. And of course, you end up with a racemic carboxylic acid. So what parts came from our aldehyde? The part that came from our aldehyde was the R group and the carbonyl carbon, which are incorporated right here. The other carbon, this one here that I'm circling in yellow, that came from the cyanide, which turned into the nitrile and then was hydrolyzed to the carboxylic acid. So again, if you're asked to do a Strecker synthesis, you want to keep track of your carbons very carefully. Overall, it's a two-step process. So this is what it would look like. In the first step, you have your ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide. And in the second step, you hydrolyze with acid. Well, again, the R group, this part right here, is going to come from the side chain after the carbonyl of your aldehyde. So counting carbons and keeping track of carbons is very important. Now, the mechanism for the Strecker synthesis is shown here. We start with our aldehyde. Again, it's in the presence of ammonium chloride. And remember, there's an equilibrium. When we have ammonium chloride, it's in equilibrium with ammonia and hydrogen chloride. And so the ammonia can come in as a nucleophile to produce this intermediate, which undergoes a proton transfer, another proton transfer, another proton transfer, and then we lose water as a leaving group. You end up producing this ion here, which is like an iminium ion, and then it makes a really good electrophile. So then the nit or sorry, the cyanide can come in as a nucleophile, and we get our alpha amino nitrile. And then we hydrolyze that using acid. And that was covered way back in chapter 20, if you want to take a look at that in section 20.13. So there we go. Our Strecker synthesis. Um, uh, mechanism. Now, you notice that all of the syntheses that we've looked at, whether it was the Strecker synthesis, we ended up with a racemic product. In the mitomalonate synthesis, we ended up with a racemic product. When we used the HBZ reaction, the hell volhard zelinsky we ended up with a racemic product then too. So you might be wondering, is there a way for me to do chiral amino acid synthesis? And the answer is, yeah, it has been developed. It says here, if you want to do the enantioselective synthesis of a naturally occurring amino acid, an L amino acid, you wouldn't want to use the methods that we've used so far because they provide racemic mixtures. Now, how do you separate those racemic mixtures into the DNL amino acids? You could either do the resolution of the racemic mixture. So that's like literally the separation using chromatography or a crystallization or something like that, or you can do an asymmetric synthesis. Now, asymmetric synthesis is preferred because you end up with no waste. You only make the desired enantiomer. It's much more um, efficient than trying to fish it out of a mixture, right? Trying to separate them is always going to be difficult. So here is the method that we can use to do asymmetric synthesis. And the way that we do this is we do what's called asymmetric hydrogenation. We start out with our alpha amino acid, and you can see the skeleton of the alpha amino acid. Here we have our carboxyl, our alpha carbon, and then we have our amine here. We have all this R group over here, and then we have an acyl group on the nitrogen. Well, what we do is we treat that with hydrogen and a chiral catalyst, and we will hydrogenate only one face of the molecule so that we end up with an enantioselective synthesis, meaning it's going to be selected for one enantiomer, the S in this case, over the other. Now, the only thing I ask you to know about enantioselective synthesis, we keep it really simple in this class, is all you have to know is that you use hydrogen and a chiral catalyst. The chiral catalysts are covered in some detail in our textbook, but I won't ask you a whole lot about that. It says that many of these chiral catalysts consist of ruthenium, complex to a chiral ligand. If you look at this ligand here, it's complex to the ruthenium atom. So here's the ruthenium atom. We've got a couple of chlorines here. Well, if you look at this, there's actually no stereocenters in here whatsoever, but you see that it's labeled R. So this is a molecule that is chiral without having a chiral center. And the reason that it's chiral is because there's no free rotation in the molecule. It's restricted into this conformation or it's locked into that conformation. So it is a chiral compound, chiral compound with no 
chiral center. And so here's an example of the synthesis of D-phenylalanine with a 99% enantiomeric excess. We start with this intermediate here. Again, here's our carboxyl group. There's our alpha carbon. There's our nitrogen. We have the acetyl group on the nitrogen. And then the part that we want in our amino acid is over here attached with a double bond to the alpha carbon. We treat that with hydrogen. This whole thing here, all you have to know is that this is your chiral catalyst. Chiral catalyst here. It's uh, ruthenium binap dichloride. Okay. We end up doing the uh, reduction on only one face of the molecule with great enantioselectivity. And then to hydrolyze the acetyl group, you would treat that with sodium hydroxide, and then you have to protonate it in the end, and you end up with a good enantiomeric excess of D phenylalanine. So that's a chiral synthesis. A little more complicated. You can see with this chiral ligand here, but there is there are many chiral ligands that have been developed by many organic chemists over the past 25 or 30 years. With all those different concepts in mind, let's take a look at a synthesis. It says identify the reagents that you would need to make each of the following amino acids using an HVZ reaction. So just as a reminder, with our HVZ reaction, the hell volhard zelinsky we start with some kind of carboxylic acid. We treat it with bromine and phosphorus tribromide in the first step, followed by treatment with water. And we end up with this guy where we have an alpha bromo carboxylic acid. Then we would treat that with excess ammonia. And that would give us this compound, okay, which is racemic. Racemic. So if we want to make leucine, what's the structure of leucine? Let me write it out here in blue. So the structure of leucine is where we have an isobutyl group like this. So if we want to make leucine, it's kind of a good one, like this. So there we go. So there's the structure of leucine. Again, we're going to make it racemic. So remember that all of this part of the molecule, okay, all of these carbons, come from our carboxylic acid, okay? They come from the carboxylic acid here. So what's our starting material gonna be? Our starting material is going to be this. We're gonna start with this carboxylic acid, and then we're gonna treat it with bromine, phosphorus tribromide, water to make the alpha bromo carboxylic acid, and then the last step, we're going to treat it with excess ammonia, and that's going to give us racemic leucine. Again, it's racemic. Let's try alanine. If we want to make alanine, what's the structure of alanine? Alanine is when we have just a methyl group like this. So what part is going to come from our carboxylic acid? It's going to be all of these carbons here, so we need propionic acid. Is our starting material. So let's write that down. We have propionic acid. In the first step, we treat this with phosphorus tribromide, bromine, water. And then in the last step, we treat it with excess ammonia. And that's going to give us alanine. And again, it is racemic. So that's using the hell volhard zelinsky reaction. What do you have to really do? You have to memorize the steps of the reaction sequence, and you have to know what the starting carboxylic acid would be. Each of the following carboxylic acids was treated with bromine and phosphorus tribromide followed by water, and the resulting alpha halo acid was then treated with excess ammonia. In each case, draw and name the amino acid product that is formed. Well, again, we're treating this with bromine, phosphorus tribromide, followed by treatment with water. I'm going to draw the intermediate on the first one. It's going to look like this. And we're going to have a bromine here. And then after we treat this with excess ammonia, we're going to end up with an alpha amino acid that looks like this. Could anybody identify this amino acid?
while I'm cleaning up my structure. So if I have an isobutyl group, yeah, exactly. Thanks, Gilbert. So we end up with leucine, perfect. Leucine. And in the next one, we're gonna end up with valine, aren't we, right? Because we're just gonna put an amine there. So, I mean, you could just do the problem this quick. You could just say, okay, well, this is my alpha carbon right here, and I'm gonna make an alpha amino acid. So this is valine. And that's it. All right. And of course, you end up doing a racemic synthesis in both case, both cases. So both are racemic. Okay, let's move on from there. Let's take a look at 25.14. It says identify the reagents necessary to make each of the following amino acids using the amido malonate synthesis. Remember the starting material in the amido malonate synthesis. Oops. Is this okay? Diethyl acetamidomalonate. So it's this guy right there. So that's our starting material. Well, if we want to make isoleucine, well, what's the structure of isoleucine? So we have our carboxyl, we have our amine, and then we have a sec butyl group. I know this is a chiral center, but I'm just going to leave it out for now. So we want to make isoleucine. Well, which parts are going to be in our electrophile? Well, remember that this part here of the molecule is going to come from this part of our um, diethyl acetamidomalonate. And the rest of the carbons, oops, I'm missing a carbon, aren't I? Oops, my mistake, my mistake, I missed a carbon. Here we go, that's more like it, okay? This is gonna come from the diethyl acetamidomalonate. There we go, that's a lot better. And the other carbons, which are these four carbons here, these are gonna come from our electrophile. So what's our synthesis gonna look like? We're gonna start with our diethyl acetamidomalonate. So let's write down its structure. We have our acetylated amine here. In the first step, we're going to treat it with sodium ethoxide. Then this is the key part is what is our electrophile? Well, it's going to have those four carbons in it. So it's going to be this compound, 2-bromobutane. Or you could call it sec-butyl bromide. Or if you want to use the iodide, that's fine too. Sec-butyl iodide, no problem. And then you would end up with this intermediate. Let's draw it out. It's going to look like this. There we go. And like this, like that, okay? Then in the next step, we're gonna hydrolyze it. So we're gonna hydrolyze this um, using H3O plus, and we're gonna cook it up, okay? And then we're gonna end up with our isoleucine, like this, there we go. And we're going to have our protonated, oops, it's racemic. Mr. Dion's got chiral synthesis on the brain. And there you go. So there's your isoleucine molecule. If you want to make alanine, and I'm just going to skip over, not skip the next two, but I'm going to do it a little bit quicker because the synthesis is the exact same. If we have alanine, if we're trying to make alanine, well, what's the structure of alanine? Alanine is when we just have a methyl group. So that means that our electrophile, would have to be methyl iodide or methyl bromide. So our electrophile is gonna be methyl iodide or methyl bromide in that case. And if you wanted to make valine, I'll use the blue pen here. If you wanted to make valine, well, what would your electrophile be in that case? Well, you've got these three carbons. So you're gonna to wanna to have one, two, three carbons. And so it's gonna be isopropyl iodide or isopropyl bromide. And so that's how you do the Amido malonate synthesis, diethyl acetamidomalonate, treat it with a base, your electrophile, then you just blow it all apart right, with hydrolysis to make the, um, to make the uh, uh, alpha amino acid, which is going to end up being racemic and in a protonated form. So I'll write that over here. This is racemic. And there you have it. All right, let's take a look at a couple others. 
It says, in the mitomalonate synthesis was performed using each of the following alkyl halides. In each case, draw and name the amino acid that was produced. Well, we've kind of already covered the first two, haven't we? Right, if you have methyl chloride, you're going to end up with this. So I'll color code it. You're going to end up with your carboxyl group, your amine, okay? And the R group is going to be the methyl. So you end up with alanine. Alanine. And the next one, if you have isopropyl, chlor isopropyl chloride, so you have this isopropyl chloride. Well, in that case, you end up with, let me just copy and paste this. You end up with an isopropyl group there. So we'll delete the methyl and we'll put in an isopropyl like this. And this is valine. And in the next one, you have 2-methyl-1-chloropropane. So let's write that out. You have 2-methyl-1-chloropropane. So what is that? That's an isobutyl group. And so in that case, you would end up with leucine. See if I have enough room here. Here we go. So this is 25.15 C. So we start with our diethyl acetamidomalonate. Okay, we're going to treat that with sodium methoxide, followed by isobutyl chloride, which is the 2-methyl-1-chloropropane, so that's this compound here, right? In the first step, you end up forming the doubly stabilized enolate. That acts as a good nucleophile. We lose our leaving group like that, and we end up with this intermediate, which looks like this. Go, so we have our acetylated nitrogen here, and then we have our iso, oops, I can do better than that. We have our isobutyl group out here, like that. Then we treat that with acid and we heat it up, right? And then we end up with this compound where we have the carboxyl group, we have the alpha carbon, we have our protonated amine because we're in strong acid, and then we have CH2, methine, and there we go, and that is um leucine and this is racemic give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one the amido malonate synthesis leucine all right cool cool great well let's move on and see where we were here we were somewhere down here. We just looked at this one. So we decided that the answer was leucine. Here, the answer was leucine. So we ended up with this. So let me just round out the slide here to make sure it's correct. There we go. And then we end up with this. And again, all our racemic. All right, 25.17 asks us about the Strecker synthesis. So it just says, um, identify the reagents necessary to make each of the following amino acids using the Strecker synthesis. So if we want to make methionine, first let's write down what the structure of methionine is. And again, you would need to refer to the table of amino acids that I gave you. So this is the structure of methionine. And again, we're doing a racemic synthesis, so I'm just going to leave the chirality out of it like this. Well, when we talked about the Strecker synthesis, this is where we took an aldehyde and we treated it with ammonium chloride in sodium cyanide. We made an alpha amino nitrile which looks like this. So we have an alpha amino nitrile. 
and we simply hydrolyze the nitrile using acid. We'll heat that up. And then we're going to end up with our alpha amino acid. So we've got our carboxyl group here like this. So this is the Strecker, Strecker synthesis. So what part came from our aldehyde? The part that came from the aldehyde, these carbons, is this part right here. So if I want to make methionine, that means that I'm going to have to start out with um, a uh, aldehyde that has these carbons coming from my aldehyde. So let's write it what that aldehyde would look like. It would look like this. So I'm kind of running out of space here. So we're just working on A in here. So I'm not covering this one and this one yet. We'll talk about those in a second. So I'm going to start with this aldehyde. So I'll write it out like this. Oops. You got carboxylic acids on the brain. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to treat this with ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide. Then we're going to end up with this. I'm just going to twist it around a little bit here so we can see it clearer. So we have but we've got um, one, two, good. Come on, I can do better than that. There we go. So it's going to look like this. We have this proton over here, of course. And then we're going to treat that with acid. And we're going to heat that up. And we're going to end up with our methionine. So it's going to look like this. Here's our carboxyl group. There's the amine. Keep in mind, this is a racemic compound. And I kind of ran out of space there, but that's it. That's our methionine molecule. We're going to need some more space to try histidine and um, phenylalanine. So let's go over to a blank document here. Probably run out of space in this too. But anyhow, this is 25.17. B. So if I want to make histidine, which is, um, let me draw the structure of histidine first since I don't have the table out here. So histidine looks like this. So we have our amine here. And we have this. There we go. So that's the structure of histidine. So which part is going to come from our aldehyde. It's going to be all of these carbons here. So these carbons here are going to come from our aldehyde. So what's our starting aldehyde going to look like? Well, let's write it up. It's going to look like this. We've got our carbonyl, we've got the methylene, and then we have our five-membered ring. I'm just going to draw a five-membered ring like that, and then I'll fix it up. So we have a nitrogen here, nitrogen here. Oops. There we go. So that's our starting material. We're going to treat this with ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide. And we're going to end up with the alpha amino nitrile. So again, we have our five membered ring like this. Okay, there we go. So we end up with our alpha amino nitrile like that. Then we're going to treat this with aqueous acid like that. We're going to end up hydrolyzing and we're going to end up with the alpha amino acid. So we have our protonated amine. Keep in mind this is a racemic synthesis. So we end up with, oops, there we go. And there you have it, like that. So that's racemic. Now the last one is phenylalanine. So we'll just do that one quickly. Um, the structure of phenylalanine is similar to alanine. You have this, you have your amine here, and you take your CH3, and then you add a phenyl to it, like that. Okay, so which carbons are going to come from uh, the aldehyde? It's going to be all of these carbons here, okay? And so your starting material in this case would be what? It would be, oops. It would be this compound. Okay, oops. There we go. 
So this would be your starting material, okay? And then you treat this with ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide, followed by hydrolysis, and that would give you the desired product. So you end up with phenylalanine, of course it's protonated, you mean, and it's racemic. So again, all are racemic. And there you go, Strecker synthesis, not too bad. Okay, not too bad, it's just a mem it's just a, um, I'm gonna have to take a look at it a few times to make sure you all have it down pat, but this is the Strecker synthesis. Strecker synthesis, very important. All right, let's try some more problems. We don't have enough here. It says, each of the following aldehydes was converted into an alpha amino nitrile followed by hydrolysis to give an amino acid. So again, this is the Strecker, Strecker synthesis. Okay, in each case, draw name the alpha amino, or the alpha amino acid that was produced. So here we have acetaldehyde. So acetaldehyde is this. Okay, as we saw before, when you do the Strecker synthesis, the part that's going to be incorporated into the um, into the uh, amino acid is going to be these two carbons here. Okay, so once we treat this with ammonium chloride, I'll write out all steps here. So we treat this with ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide. We're going to end up with this compound. So we have the alpha amino nitrile like this. Okay, and then we're going to hydrolyze that using acid, and we're going to cook that up. And what are we going to end up with? We're going to end up with this compound where we have the carboxyl group. We have the amine pronated like that. <clears throat> and then we just have a methyl group, right? This methyl group right here is this one here. And so this is alanine. I'll use the three-letter abbreviation. The next one is 3-methylbutanol. So if I have 3-methylbutanol, that's this compound. Again, this part, oops, I'm missing a carbon, I'm cutting one out here. All of this, okay, is the part that's gonna end up, um, you know, like this part here. So again, same thing. We're gonna treat it with ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide. We're gonna make the alpha amino nitrile, which is gonna look like this. So there's our amine. There's our nitrile. I just like to draw that proton in. Then we hydrolyze this with acid. And we end up with this compound, which is racemic. And this is leucine. So I'll use the three letter abbreviation. And the last one is 2 methyl propanol. So if we have pro, oops, propanol, come on, which is this. Okay, there's 2-methylpropanol. Well, in this case, we're going to end up with this alpha amino nitrile. So let's write that out. There's our amine. There's our nitrile. And then we're going to hydrolyze that. And if you don't like the way that I'm writing it, if you want to keep it in the exact same you know, orientation, you just draw the amine, except now you protonate it. And then you just put a carboxyl group like this. So what's your side chain? It's an isopropyl group. So you ended up making valine. So this is valine. And again, all are racemic. All right. And to round out this section, we'll take a look at identifying the starting alkene necessary to make each of the following amino acids using an asymmetric um, catalytic hydrogenation. So this is all I would expect you to be able to do here is let's say you wanted to make L-alanine, which is this compound. So you want to, make, I'll draw it as this vitrion like this. 
your starting material would just be this, okay? This is all you've got to know, is that you have your carboxyl group, okay? Your nitrogen has an acetyl group on it, so acetyl group, or in fact, this is a better way to write it, like that, and then you have a double bond, okay? Since you've only got a methyl group here, you're just going to have a methylene here. So all you've got to be able to do is say H2 and chiral catalyst. That's it. And that's going to give you, that's going to produce this compound. So you're going to end up with this after the hydrogenation. But you've still got that acetyl group on there. So you're going to blow that off. In the first step, you're going to use sodium hydroxide. In the next step, you're going to treat it with aqueous acid. And that'll give you the protonated form like this. And there you have it. Okay, oops. Come on. There we go. So that gives you L alanine. Say you wanted to make valine, L valine, same type of deal. Okay, I'll just again write it as this vitrion. So NH3 plus. So valine is where you have an isopropyl group. So your starting material would look just like the first one. Okay, I'll even copy it. I can even copy most of this, okay? I could copy this whole thing, come to think of it. So let's copy this. Okay, we'll put it over here. And then all you'd have to do is add the two methyl groups here, two methyl groups there, and two methyl groups there to make valine, okay? So not much to it. And then for leucine, <clears throat> If you want to make leucine, which looks like this, again, I'm drawing this vitter ion here. So there we go. And there we go. Okay, so your starting material is just going to be this. So you're going to have your carboxyl group. You've got your nitrogen that is acetylated. You've got your double bond, son of a gun. You've got your double bond. Then you have, you've got the rest of the molecule like that and there you have it nothing to it so that would be your starting material and then you do the same two steps okay hydrogenation chiral catalyst sodium hydroxide and water or sorry acid so one two three steps and then you would end up with the desired compound it's an enantioselective synthesis you end up with the protonated form of the amine and there you go. Done. Just like that. L-leucine.